to be someone who thinks about big ideas. All of you here are helping us create the intellectual and technological climate that will make a human mission to Mars possible. President Obama has given NASA a mission with a capital M to focus again on the big picture of exploration and the crucial research and development that will be required for us to move beyond low Earth orbit. He's charged us with carrying out the inspiring missions that only NASA can do, which will take us farther than we've ever been to orbit Mars and eventually land on. I think those of you attending this conference know that human spaceflight is far from over. With the successful completion of the space shuttle program, we now open a new era of exploration where destinations even farther into the solar system will be possible for humans. That era is already underway, and the discussions and debates you have at this conference are part of the wonderful landscape in which these missions will take shape. At NASA, we've been sending missions to Mars since the 1960s. We've been on the surface since the 1970s. As you know, we're preparing to send the Curiosity rover to Mars this fall, and I know we'll be in for yet another incredible round of discoveries. I'm confident that humans will be there in the 2030s as the president has envisioned. There are a lot of great presentations coming up at this conference, and a lot of my NASA colleagues will be filling you in on our current work at Mars and what we're learning from missions that are completed. I'll also be looking forward to their reports on what they learn from you. Enjoy yourselves and know that the next grand challenge to reach the red planet is firmly in NASA's sights. Thank you all for your curiosity, your innovation, your innovative ideas, and above all, your hard work. Okay, so thank you, Charles Bolden, for that. I just want to uh, now introduce our next speaker, Dr. Everett Gibson. He is a senior scientist at NASA Johnson Space Center. Most notably, Dr. Gibson was a co-leader with uh, David McKay and Kathy Tom Thomas Keptra the for the defining work on, of course, the Martian meteorite, Ellen Hills 84001, published in 1996. This work has been acclaimed as one of the outstanding discoveries in science in the 20th century. Please welcome Dr. Gibson. Thank you very much. Could you have the lights dropped a little bit? Uh, here. I'd appreciate it. I'm happy today to be able to come to you and, and let you know where we are after 15 years. Sunday will be the 15th year anniversary of our announcement in, in 1996 of the, of the research which we'd been conducting and was published in the journal Science. I'm only the point of a, of a team that has been working this project at, at, at Johnson Space Center in Houston, not only Dave McKay, Kathy Thomas, Kepard, Simon Clement, Sue Wentworth, and, and Lauren White. Now, as we all know, we have a love here, or we wouldn't be in the Mars Society. Mars the planet which we think could be their closest neighbor that may have signs of evidence of past life. In 1976-77, I was a young Apollo scientist working on the Apollo rocks, but also got asked to join the Viking team. There I am standing beside the Viking lander. The Viking had five experiments for search of life. A gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, the three uh, biology experiments, and a camera. The camera did not see any critters hopping around on the surface, so we can rule that out. The, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer analyzed soils from the surface, and little did we know we couldn't find any carbon, but the ultraviolet radiation destroys this. As, as mentioned by Paul in the previous talk, Gil Levine had the labile release experiment, and it depends on how you interpret that data, uh, whether there's signatures of biology occurring. Some believe it's valid. I personally think it should be reflown and we test it again. Now, as I said, we discovered that ultraviolet radiation destroys organic carbon on the surface, complex molecules. But we know that Mars has an infall of meteoritic material. Here's a list of some of the organic molecules that are found in the carbonaceous chondrite, in this case, the Murchison meteorite. So clearly, organic matter 
has been introduced to the planet. And some of these carbonaceous chondrites have amino acids, as we know, that are building blocks of life, which we have here on the Earth. The question is, did Mars have an original biota itself? It could be mixed with this. From these starting blocks and ingredients of life, we had the basic ingredients on Mars. Just as we look at the planet, we see our perceptions and ideas change as we get more data. For example, the perception of water. In the early 70s, we said the planet was basically arid, no water. Then we, as we got more data in the 80s, we began to see, well, it might have been periodic, sporadic rainfall. And then it might have been even larger bodies, including standing oceans. And then today, we're back to a point that we see none on the surface other than the ice at the polar caps and some buried beneath other selective regions on the planet. We know the planets had an active groundwater table, and I'll get more into that later. But there's water that moves beneath the surface, and there's lens of ice that there. Geothermal heat may be melting this, and so there's active water beneath the surface. We'll see that in some of the meteorites that I'll talk about later. Evidence, as Paul pointed out, the images that have been returned from the orbiters clearly show features that could be interpreted as evidence of movement of water or fluid phases. Constant elevation around basins are very suggestive that there might have been shorelines or standing bodies of water on the planet, which, which could have been oceans. Now, if this is the case, we know there's abundance of liquid water, oceans and lakes early in the history of the planet. Carbon organics might have been there. And we had energy sources because we knew we had volcanoes, we had impact craters, so we had the energy that was available. So Mars had all these ingredients. What has happened? What happened? Do we have any means of able, able to look at this with time? But an interesting thing was happening as we were doing the Viking experiments and, and, and the orbiters that were returning this data. Independent of that, in 1976-77, a program was going on at the southern end of the Earth in, the, in Antarctica. A new source of extraterrestrial materials were made available to us we were finding black rocks on white ice. This was quite amazing. Along the Trans-Antarctic Mountain Range, which is the mass that, that divides the, the continent, as you see across here, ice moves from higher elevations to lower elevations. As it comes into the mountains, it stops and tries to go over them. The freight train affects the ice behind it, pushing down slope and the ice moving up and the catabatic winds coming in and sublimating the ice away. Anything that has fallen on that ice will be left on that ice and be available for somebody to just go and pick up. So all up and down this ice barrier, samples of black rocks or gray rocks, green rocks have been picked up. There have been over 21,000 samples collected to date. Over 21,000 samples collected to date. We found in the early 80s a sample that was a sample of the moon. Wow, we knew what the lunar samples were all about. So the modelers that said we had material knocked off the, the moon, it got transferred to the Earth. Why not about Mars? Of this, these 21,000 samples, we also found that there are 12 rocks from Mars. We'll get more into this a little later. This was my home. This was my home in 1979 when we went down to collect samples in the early recovery programs. During our field season, this particular soccer-sized rock was recovered. It's an amazing rock. It's Elephant Range 79001. It turned out to be 165 million years old. This rock, when it was cut apart, had some amazing features. The right-hand side, 80% of it, on boundaries cutting across here, was a coarse grain rock. Over on this lower left-hand side, is a fine grain basalt that cool very fast. So in this rock, we had a contact of two different basalt units, one which cooled slowly and made these large crystals, and one which cooled very fast and made the very small crystals. In this rock, we also had these lens of glass and cracks that were filled with glass. A colleague in Houston named Don Bogard analyzed the gases that were trapped in these glasses, and little did he know that he would make a smoking gun detection. Don found that the composition of the gases 
in this meteorite match exactly one to one the gases which the mass spectrometer measured on the surface of Mars by the Viking. We found for the first time evidence that we had a rock from Mars. How else, else could we get the atmosphere of Mars trapped inside this rock? That was only one of the clues. Later, as we began to study the samples, Robert Clayton, University of Chicago, began to analyze the oxygen that's in the silicates. Bob found that there the three isotopes of oxygen, 16, 18, and 17, 17 least abundant. If you plot the ratios of these against all other rocks in our solar system, we found a small line up here called the SNC line lay different from the Earth-Moon line. It did not lie on this line, it lay above it, as you look here where it's enhanced. What it says is the materials of the cosmos that made Mars was from a distinct reservoir than the reservoir that made the Earth and the Moon. We had a second method of detection. We had different samples, samples from Mars, by the trapped atmosphere and the oxygen. We also have other techniques of trace and minor elements. We can plot these the oxygen in different manners, it clearly lies in different means, so there's step separate reservoir of silicates on Mars. Along with a trapped atmosphere, somebody asked you, how do you know we have rocks from Mars? These are the two answers. Now, Mother Nature is neat. She delivers samples throughout the cosmos. The impact on Mars only requires a velocity of greater than 5.7 kilometers a second to, to be removed from the surface. That's only a little bit greater than that 30-06 deer rifle. So you can have materials removed from the planet, travel through the solar system, and interact with other gravitational fields, and they pull to the surface. We had a rock that was recovered in 1984. This rock had a crystallization age of 4.09 billion years old. We found out that 4 billion years ago, groundwater began interacting with this rock. The groundwater formed carbonates. These carbonates moved through this rock. As the water was retreated, it left behind the carbonates, containing phases which were transported by the water. 16 million years ago, an impact occurred on Mars. Kicked in space, traveled, landed on Earth 13,000 years ago in Antarctica. Here's a history of a very interesting rock. This is the Allen Hills meteorite. This is probably the most famous studied rock that scientists have looked at. Here's a small sample of it. I'll leave it up here and I'll show you later if you want to look at it across the lunch. This rock contained a fracture, and along this fracture is where these carbonates were found. They were cinnamon brown colored olivoids with a black white black rim. As we look at it, other pieces, we see there's massive amounts of carbonates within this. The scale of this this is one millimeter. But clearly, if the evidence of carbonate, you can find out something about the hydrosphere and the atmosphere of the body which they came from. As we began to look at this rock, we began to find other features. One of the things that drew, drew our attention, Dave McKay and I were on the microscope one night, SEM, and we found this feature. It completely blew us out of water. We didn't know what to think of it. We sat on it for quite a while, looking at it, imaging it, I took a copy of this home, accidentally it was left on my desk. My wife, who's a biologist, saw it. She came up to me and said, what are you doing with that worm-like feature in, the, in that SEM image? I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, we kept it quiet and we continued to study the rock. Others said there's no other features in this sample. Here is a replica of the freshly broken surface of this rock. You break the rock in the carbonates and you put a metal down on the fresh broken surface bring it over and look at it, and these are replicas of other features on this rock. This was in a discussion in Science Magazine. Some people said we'd never peer-reviewed or discussed this. Well, it was out there. An industry picked it up. You can buy the same feature for $9.95. <laughs> now, these carbonates were the key because as we looked at them, we knew they were low temperature because we'd published a paper in 1994, not 96, where two years earlier, that said that oxygen isotopes in these carbonates suggested farming below 100 degrees C. Other critics said they were farmed at 600 to 800 degrees C, ruling out any possibility of life. 
Well, you don't hear those critics anymore because their data is wrong. New data from Caltech this year showed they were farmed probably between 23 and 28 degrees Celsius. This is from study of the oxygen uh, systematics in this rock. Clearly within regions that living systems could survive. As we began to look at the rock, the carbonates were unusual. They contained variations in their composition. They also contained evidence of organic matter inside a rock from Mars, something which Viking was not able to find, reduced carbon. Then we also began to look at this from the morphological features. And then the last thing that we found was the biominerals. This is a mineral of magnetite of particular morphology, composition, shape, uh, trace elements and all, and it can only be produced by Darwinian evolution through biology and not from any inorganic process that we know. If you could make magnetites of that purity, the recording magnetic memory system industry would go absolutely bonkers and use this. But only Mother Nature can produce magnetites of this high purity. I'll get to it a little later. Now, we took this data, we continued to refine it for two years. We did not let the information out. We tried to make sure it was good, solid evidence. We wrote a paper and submitted it to science. It's been probably one of the more publicized papers. As was noted by Paul, it's something that made Bill Clinton famous. He had the announcement on August 7th in 96. This event was a true happening. I never anticipated anything like this, nor did any of us. After we made the announcement, the web crashed. In 1996, it did not have the capabilities to handle the volume of information that was in the requests that were being subjected to it after we made the announcement. It just folded. Amazing that it happened. There were 34 television cameras in the news in the press conference. Uh, CNN went for an hour and 20 minutes with no commercials. This cartoon summed up, I think, as well as anything. Cal, the cartoonist of Baltimore Sun, displays us as a very staunch-like scientist here. We have some circumstantial evidence that might point to a tentative way to the slight possibility that maybe three billion years ago there's a chance that there could have been life on Mars. And the media went absolutely bonkers. Now, not only did they continue there, but we had backing. And a lot of our critics said, well, you didn't have the right peer reviews or anything on this manuscript. And after getting permission from all the reviewers in, in, in science, this is a set of five external reviewers that our manuscript was subjected to. John Cronin, late John Cronin of Organics, who did the amino acids and the meteorites, Stan Warwick, fossils, Don Brownlee, particles, Ken Nielsen, iron, magnetites, and Carl Sagan, who looked at the big picture. All five of those, plus the editors of science, said, go ahead and publish it with minor revisions. Now, when this paper was published, the spacefaring nations of the world changed their Mars exploration programs. You know, data in the manuscript after 15 years has not been discredited. The interpretations have been challenged, and that's what it goes on to. Not the data, but just the interpretations. Clearly, stimulus is added to the Mars program, so we'll get to this. We had stories in Time Magazine, full cover spread. U.S. News report put us behind Bob Dole. Other cartoonists at the Fairfax Journal said that this was clearly something that would, the scientists would dance for an increase in NASA's budget. What did this mean? Really, it's only circumstantial, some said, but let's take a vote. All that thinks is life on Mars, and then the aliens out here clearly vote yes. <laughs> Others said that this dead, deadly rock virus affects researchers, you know, all out cure to, to find this alien disease. But this is something that happened that I want to spend a moment on. The information did not leak through the integrity of the scientific community. The reviewers, the editorial process, the story did not get out. The story got out through politics. Bill Clinton's advisor, Richard Morris, who you still see advising on Fox News and a few other net networks, Dick Morris was having an affair with uh, a young lady who was a prostitute in Washington uh, named Sherry Rollins. He had his, uh, after we had briefed the president and the staff, Gore and all, on a Friday, a uh, copy of the manuscript was left at the White House. Richard Marsh took it in the evening of his rendezvous at the Jefferson Hotel with Miss Rollins. After that evening, uh, he went home, he left the manuscript there, 
and she began to try to sell it. And this is documented in Kathy Sawyer's book very well. She said, we found proof of life on Pluto. Well, I was so tired the next morning I wrote Pluto. Well, she tried to sell it to her, to the New York Star, which she'd sold stories to before. And so this leaked the next Sunday, the next day. My, it was sold among the tabloids. Nobody wanted to buy the story. It was sent to the UK. Colin Pillinger, my colleague, got a phone call at 2 a.m. in the morning and said, are there worms on Mars? Uh, he told him what he thought about the question of worms on Mars and, and sent him the abstract. He saw the manuscript with my initials on the upper corner, which I'd given out when it went to the White House. So then the story began to leak because it built up and, and it got out. So the tabloids and others picked it up and history was made. But the important thing of this is what happened. OMB and the excitement of the program was supposed to be told NASA to reduce the space science budget $6 billion for over the next five years. The Mars exploration program was really in a disarray. We'd lost the Mars climate orbiter and the Mars polar lander. The layoffs had already been announced at JPL. After the announcement, Dan Golden said the restoration occurred. It was put back in the budget. Plus, NSF had new programs for search of life in strange environments. Center for Astrobiology Institutes was created. Exploration program was completely revived, and we've had six successes of going to Mars with landers or orbiters after this. Ed Weiler told me in conversation emails last night that he said clearly this is the stimulus of what changed the NASA's program. Well, the possibility of life on Mars is just really too thrilling for mankind to ignore. So after 15 years, you know, our four lines of evidence still stand, and the magnetite continues to be the strongest evidence. And to remind you what we're doing, this is not something that you can just go out with your home belt microscope and work on this. We're dealing in very small features that are very subtle and, and, and are take a lot of time and effort to measure. We are looking at features that are down here in, in the nanobes size of slightly above a virus and between a virus and a bacteria. We're looking at features that are 100 nanometers in size. And can you make chemical analysis of this? It's not something you can go out and do quickly. If you look at these carbonates, they are very complex. They have an interesting history. And as you look at this, this is a quick close-up of how, what we think these carbonates may have. You have a fracture, which water is percolated through it. As the water's there, the, the trace elements and all are left in the deposit when the water recedes. You leave behind these carbonates that have the remnants on the outer parts of what's been carried in this, this water. Maybe the organics, maybe the minerals that are entrained in, in it. And so from this, you then begin to look at it. You realize that this is almost like the shape of a Reese's pizza. Well, to do this, you then have new techniques. In 1996, we did not have the capability of using focus on beam extraction techniques where we could go in and actually extract out 50 to 100 nanometer sized grains, pull them out, and then do the composition and studies with transition electron microscope. So what we do here, is we take a grain, we identify regions, and we begin to cut a slice out. And how we do this is we identify the regions, and then with the technique, we can cut these out. And then we can pull them out and study a little tiny grain that is, is less than a tenth of a micron in size. Here's the scale. Here's a human hair. In this bright spot in the center is a small cutout area. And if we blow it up over here, it says Mars Meteorite Research Team. This is the size of what we, we're extracting. Now, we're interested in this mineral magnetite because it's so unusual. Here on the Earth, it's formed in two methods, inorganic ways of forming magnetite, or it can be formed by biology, magnetotactic bacteria. You know, birds orient with mag magnetite in their brain by the polar field, magnetic fields. This is the scale that we're looking at. These small magnetites within the magnetotactic bacteria. Now, when you have this, if it's biological, it has to meet a set of criteria. Whether the particles may be in chains, they may be elongated along one particular axis, they have an unusual shape, their chemistry must be absolutely ultra pure in the lattice crystal uh, thing in their single domain. So with this, you have to set the parameters. Now in the Allen Hills, 
One colleague has found chains of magnetite, the late Emory Friedman. Now, if you look at these magnetites up close, and the scale here, this is 50 nanometers, 50 nanometers. Now, human hair is 60 microns. You go down 100 times below that, and then you go down another uh, 10 to 50. Now, as we extract these and do the analysis of the magnetites in Allen Hills, we can do the two-dimensional the, the, the crystallography of these along different axes. And then we can scan them multiple times and put this back together. And you can get a three-dimensional crystal. And it's a unique geometry from the biology. Now, it's, it's what is seen in the magnetotactic bacteria, identical. And two-dimensional, the Allen Hills are here. And this is the, from the MV1 magnetite in the bacteria. You put this in three dimensions. Here's the Allen Hills, and here is that. It's an MV1. Very unusual crystal shape, and it cannot be produced by inorganic processes in this high purity. We'll get to it a little more. So you have these six parameters. If you take the life equation out in the Allen Hills, because we don't have the bug that's alive, I mean, uh, that we see, but it matches those properties there very well. We wrote a paper in 2009. This is a 48-page manuscript. It's very detailed to large readers. It's kind of boring. But to those that are our critics, after reading this manuscript, a lot of our critics have gone silent on us. A massive dose of data will kill a lot of criticism. What we did is we looked at these crystals, not only their composition and structure, but the minor and trace element chemistry inside. Because when Mother Nature, biology, operates, she cleans things up. The minor and trace elements are not brought along when biology is operating. But when inorganic processes like thermal decomposition or shock from an impact or something of this type, those minor and trace elements are incorporated into that magnetite. They are not incorporated in this unusual suite of magnetites that we have in the Allen Hills meteorite. Now I'll go through that a little bit here. Now, one of the things we have to remember is the difficulty of the value of a biomarker is directly proportional to the difficulty making it through some inorganic process. Andy Knoll has said this. So the thermal decomposition or shock processes cannot make these pure magnetites. And Joe Krishvank, another of the world's experts on magnetites, said, you know, early Mars has been a good place for life to be. No one has been able to disprove this hypothesis that the magnetite is biogenic. Now, this is not coming from our team, but from members of the community. And here's what we're talking about. When you have a carbonate that has minor and trace elements in it, and you're trying to produce an iron oxide, Fe3O4, if you have a thermal process or you have a shock process, it only goes and produces a magnetite that trains those minor elements and trace elements. When you have biology operating, it makes a completely pure magnetite. Very simple, but it's difficult for some people to get through their head that this is what is going on. Now, the carbonates and the magnetites very clearly are quite complex, more than most people thought. We had a bunch of critics that jumped on the bandwagon and said they were going to kill this idea very quick because it could be produced by saying iron-rich carbonates could be heated, then you could produce the magnetite, or you had some other process like a shock, an impact, you could produce it. You can produce some of these phases, but they can contain the minor and the trace elements. When biology is operating, it does it clean. Now, a lot has been written. Almost, I can count so many manuscripts that simply says what this item in Science News said. The scientific community has been mostly abandoned the idea of fossil Mars life in Allen Hills as one of the very lines of evidence for life has been given a non-biological explanation. I'm reminded by something that was written many years ago. <laughs> now, also something else. Why has every exploration program in the last few years, after the data has gotten stronger, 
made a note that the goal of this is to go to Mars and find the signatures of microbial life, clues about whether life ever existed. If you'd have said that 15 years ago, you'd been burned at the stake. You'd been ignored. But the data is slowly coming around. And let's look at some of that data. There are 58 samples from Mars available for study. We have more than 92 kilograms of Martian materials in our hands on the Earth today to look at. 92 kilograms. Do we need to spend five to 10 billion or 20 billion dollars to go to Mars to get a sample of Mars? Well, I think it's important to go to Mars and get a documented sample in the right location. We have samples that are across the different ages of the body, from the Noachian, Hesperian, and Amazonian. Early Mars crust to secondary alteration products are available, but we have no sedimentary rocks or surface samples available. Every sample we have available is from a tenth of a kilometer to a kilometer depth. So they've all been from beneath the surface subjected to the Martian groundwater environment. Organic should be preserved. Janice Bishop came up with this nice table to look at the history of Mars. From four and a half billion years after it was formed and periods when it was warm and wet and ocean and, and all back in the first 600 million years. And then as it goes through time today when it's you know, dry with water maybe beneath the surface. We have samples from the Allen Hills at 4.09 billion years ago to the suite of knock lights at 1.3 with alterations at 600 million years or so. We have samples of the sugar, 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 sugar tights at 165 million years ago and evidence of alteration post 165 million years or before, uh, up to recent times. So we have samples across this ages of the planet to look at. For example, 100 years ago in Egypt, the Nakla meteorite fell. This meteorite is 1.3 billion years ago, old. 600 to 700 million years after it had been crystallized on Mars from, from an igneous event, groundwater interacted with it, forming these orange-brown clays called itingzite. This itingzite clay is very fascinating. It contains a wonderful story which is only just now being written. 10 to 15, 10 to 12 million years ago, an impact occurred kicking it off hundred years ago, it landed in Egypt. Now, this rock, as I said, contains evidence of pre-terrestrial aqu aqu pre aqueous alteration. A scientist who's at Arizona State named Lori Leshen, who left there, had done some beautiful work on the deuterium-hydrogen ratios in this alteration. And it was clear that this did not occur on the Earth. It occurred on Mars from the groundwater interactions on Mars. It was dated to be 600 to 700 million years ago by Tim Swindle, University of Arizona. There is also organic matter in this rock that does not contain any carbon-14. So we have indigenous organic matter from Mars, and it's a young sample to study. If you look at it, you see this orange-brown within these cracks on the surface of the rock. This is where water, water on Mars has interacted with the silicates. This is available to study. And as you look at it better, you see these fractures. And along the fractures, you have these little tunnels coming out that, that are here. It's fascinating what is found in here. Organic matter will be found in some of these. Now, we look at it. We see along these fractures, they're, they're comp complex. You have the itingsite, which is a, is a clay. You have carbonate phases that are there with the primary silicates like the olivine. As we go and look at it more, you can see the individual units of the eating site. Here you see at least four different distinct layers of eating site. That says perhaps four different flushes of water has gone through this silicate and laid these down under four different events. Now, as we look at this up close, here we have a fresh piece of nocula that we just broke it. As soon as we broke it, we began to study this little region here. Now, what, what do we see? We're going to see an amazing fresh surface of a piece of Mars. And in this fresh surface, we're going to see four features that are very unusual. We have a little feature here, here, one over here, and there's one other one over here. Now, within this, we can take this and we can do the composition of this. And what this is, this is mostly salt. 
that has flushed into this crack and void. And this halite, along with other phases, as we map the composition, the blue is sodium chloride. The green is the silicates. We have in here, we have carbonaceous matter, which is this yellow. This carbonaceous matter is indigenous Martian material. It's not a contamination that's been introduced on this sample. Here we look at one of them. And we're going to take this one. The scale on this, this is two microns over here. We're going to take this feature and we're going to cut it apart. With our new techniques, we can map it the composition. The red is a map of carbon. We can see that the hot spots where this feature is around. And we continue to look at it. And here are the others. So, within the eating site in fresh Nokla, we have organic matter. Some of these little trains that are coming out, Martin Fisk at Oregon has looked at this and he's done mapping in fresh basal oceanic basalts. And he finds at the end of these, he can do dappy stains for the presence of DNA and organic uh, bi biological material. And they glow. Are these going to work in Nokla? No because this material is 600 to 700 million years old and it will not fluoresce. So we have to find another way of doing it. But the signatures may be there. We have another meteorite from Mars, one from the Japanese collection. And this is a large sample. This is about four kilograms. This is, is Yamato 593. It's the same age as Nokla 1.3 billion years ago. And within it, it also contains an abundance of itingsite, organic matter within these trails, contains the funnels, the galleries of this material. It is out there. Is this contamination? No. This is what terrestrial contamination looks like. We've done this. Our critics say, hey, you have this. Here you see evidence of a material like this. You have these stringers. This is in Shrigati, which is also contamination, but we know how to separate the contamination from what's indigenous. We even see in the Allen Hills some material out on the fusion crust from Antarctica, the contamination. This is not what we're studying. So you have to know how to separate this. Uh, within six, seven months ago, Richard Hoover published a paper in the Journal of Cosmology that had these features. Now, I want to know, you know, this is not indigenous to the sample. This is contamination. We've tried to talk to Richard about this for many years. So don't get too excited about that. Now what we can do though, is we take these small pieces and we can heat them under oxygen and have that carbon combusted to carbon dioxide and then we'll measure that carbon dioxide's ratio of carbon 12 to carbon 13. That'll give us an indication of whether the carbon is inorganic or organic or magmatic, our contamination. So we do the Allen Hills meteorite and we see that there's organic component that's down here we see that there's a carbonate component. And we can do this and separate out the different forms of carbon. And when we do this, we also look at the organic matter that's in these materials. From the Allen Hills, the organics that are in the carbonates. We also see in Nokla, we see organics in the Ittingsite. So there is indigenous organic material from Mars. Can we put a face on it? Do we really know where it's located? And that's what we've been working on. And this, again, is tedious work. I mean, this is the results. Throw this up. This is really results of about three years of work, finally disseminated into a few slides. Along these cracks, we, we can take these materials, extract out one of these little features by the, the focus ion beam extraction techniques, and go in and analyze it. Can we separate its oxygen? That's what we're going to do. We take a small piece of a fracture. We extract it by drilling it out in taking that piece, and in taking it and subjecting it to stepped combustion under oxygen. We do a blank. We do the sample, and the key thing is the red region. The red region is that area where hydrocarbons or organic matter comes out, and we find that we have identified the organic matter on Mars having isotopic composition of minus 18 to 20 per mil. That's pretty nifty. It's not what is over in the, in, in the background. Other features, there are some unusual features within this meteorite. 
that we've save back and kept and look until we have the right analytical techniques because you don't want to shoot everything that you have if you can't do it correctly. Within the NOCLA, there are these features, structures that change of spheres that are overdraped with organic matter. And it's called biofilm. This is a polysaccharide. It's what an organism excretes when it gets stressed. Is this stressed Martian organism poop or whatever he, he's giving out? I don't know. But it's fascinating that it's there. Biofilms survive the geological record over time. On the Earth, we have examples from recent ones, all the way back to, to the Ivory Coast banded irons of 2.1 billion years ago. So this may be a handle that we can use to look for even more conclusive proof. There are really unique structures within the Nokla biofilms and Ittingsite. We'll see what those bring us. These look like features that we see within Columbia River basalt of bacteria that are there, but these are not terrestrial contaminants in the NOCLA. Look at this feature with a filament off the back of it. We see desiccated features like this. It has an iron silicon carbon composition. We're saving it so one of these days we're going to cut across it when we have the right technique and try to go in and do the organics that may be inside that. What are some of the interesting things that we've seen? This is data that has never been shown before to an audience until today. I'm not going to comment a whole lot on it. Fresh broken surface of NOCLA. What do you see right here? What do you see this looks like? Does that look like inorganic processes? What about that? We're studying it. It has us puzzled also. There are interesting features within this rock, clearly worthy of study. It's available for the scientific community to go look at. So we know something about Mars carbon. This is something we did not know about 10 years ago. We know there's contaminants in the samples. We know there's indigenous carbon. There's inorganic carbonates. There's organic reduced matter. There may be samples of original carbon from the volcanoes on Mars. We now know the atmospheric carbon that was on Mars today from the Phoenix, Phoenix mission. We have unique carbon in these meteorites, which is really great. The Spirit rover found evidence of massive carbon outcrops for the first time on Mars up near the Comanche Peak uh, Spur area. Some of these rocks contain, as Mars published in Science, evidence of carbonate. A couple years ago, Mike Mooma and his team, and after detection originally by an experiment Fortisano had on the European Space Agency, Mars Express, the detection of methane in the Mars atmosphere at selective regions. Some said this was probably from basically inorganic processes or it could have been from biology. Methane should not survive on Mars beyond 300 years, uh, or 300 days, I'm sorry. It's days, not years. Uh, some said it's from a geothermal process, but there's been no hot mapping that I'm, I'm aware of that has been thermal spots seen on Mars that could be producing the, the methane. It's found in regions that are low. Now, could this be from biology? I'm sorry, the methane is destroyed in 300 years. Um, I don't know, but it's an area that's high in methane. It's also high in carbon. This is intriguing. Could there be an active methanogenic bacteria on Mars? As Muma pointed out, Mars is an Earth-like planet. So what are we looking at? We have a Mars timeline that we have samples from the past, the Noachian, all the way up through the present Amazonian. We have periods of time when it was warm and wet, all the way where it's now cold and dry with active groundwater and ice beneath the surface. Through the geological period, you know, as we know, it's gone from a heavy impact bombardment, the valley networking, all the way to a period of low impacts to a cold, dry body. Now, as we put these together, on the Earth, we have certain fossil biosignatures that we used to come up with, say, do you have evidence of life or not? They're basically body parts, the body fossils. Do you have a unique mineral that may be there that's a biomineral? Do you have fabrics? that indicate, say, like the stromatolites in Australia or other places that suggest biology has laid this down with time. 
Do you have unusual organic molecules? Are there isotopes there? And as you look at this, over what we have done and what we've put together, we have begun to match these criteria quite well, I think. I may be boasting, but the data is slowly building. And I think we again have to keep an open mind on this. As the Mars Science Lab is going to Gale Crater to try to understand this particular region of where water might have been in the past, could have biology operated, the best instrument on board is the SAM suite which will be looking at trying to detect the preference of organic molecules and hopefully their isotopic compositions. Well, I thought we had the best instrument when we had the gas analysis suite from the Beagle 2. Unfortunately, that has never been flown again, but we could have looked at these same uh, suite of, of compounds that they're looking at. And I wish the team the best of luck because I think they have the best shot at doing it of anything we have on the horizon. Now, there's another suite of instruments going along with MSL. There'll be other colleagues will talk about this week, and I'll not say any more about it. But there's something we have to keep in mind. Mars is very difficult to operate at. Currently, Mars is winning. They don't want us to come and see them. Out of all the probes that or missions have gone, Mars has let failures occur 26 times, 17 successes, 60% of the time we've not been successful. The last six in a row missions have been successful. Hopefully we can get MSL down. But we have to keep this in mind. It's a difficult. And to let you know one example, the Beagle 2 spacecraft, which I was from, on the team member, an interdisciplinary scientist, we thought we understood everything. We had a set of parameters for the spacecraft to enter the atmosphere. At certain altitudes and certain pressures, we would have a drogue chute released and then the main chutes and it would come on down. We did not know that a weather system moved across Mars that changed the atmospheric pressure 40%. As our spacecraft came in, the drogue chute came out, it was thinking it was much higher above the surface. As it continued into the ISTA's landing site, the pressure as we neared the surface, the instrument again thinking it was high and we released next one, the main shoes, and then splat. We were on the surface. Mars can change you and can mess you up. The mystery, mysterious red lady can throw all sorts of curveballs at you. And we have to keep this in mind. And that's why we lost the Beagle 2. That's our atmospheric model did not account for the reduction of atmospheric pressure. Mars, the secrets, they will be revealed in the future. It will take a little longer because hopefully we can get missions there. But we have samples of Mars currently today that we can study. Now, if there's evidence of ancient life on Mars, or is there present life going on on Mars? You know, why not both? And with that, I think, you know, I'll be happy to take questions. I've gone over a lot of this fairly fast, but I think it's been an interesting 15 years since the announcement was really made really 18 for our team because we worked on it three years before we ever made the announcement. But I think a lot of new doors have been open, new techniques introduced, and we have a better Mars exploration program for it. Thank you. I'm available for questions. The Russians have completed thermal vacuum testing on the November scheduled launch of the Phobos soil sample return mission. While the impact in gardened and space weathered regolith on Phobos is going to be somewhat messed up compared to pristine samples returned from the surface of Mars, there should be splatter samples mixed in on the surface of Phobos from the same stuff that was launched off Mars. What are current best estimates for the fraction of Phobos soil that might be Martian ejecta? I don't know the answer to that, but I'll tell you what my own ideas are about what they're going to find. I think we're going to find essentially the same material we found in carbonaceous chondrites. The density is low, as it similar to carbonaceous chondrites. We're going to be looking at something that has an abundance of hydrated minerals. It, spectral 
signatures indicate there's probably some organics there. Now, uh, over time, how much of the, uh, the Martian material has been captured by the satellite, honestly, that's not an area that I'm an expert in. I just can't comment on it. I'm sorry. Bob. Okay. Um, just uh, one brief comment and, and one more extended comment. Uh, the brief comment, by the way, is with respect to the score, um, which shows much more failures than, or significantly more failures than uh, successes. But if you just look at the American program, you have 15 successes and five failures. Um, so in fact, uh, our track record is, uh, we're batting 750, and the rest of the world has one success out of 22. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, but so that's one point. The, the s second thing, though, uh, is this. Um, you mentioned this business with Dick Morris. Now, um, back. Wait, I, I got to be careful. I have two Dick Morrises. I have a colleague, Dick Morris, who discovered the carbonates on Mars, and then there's a political Dick Morris. I'm Separate talking about them. the political one. Okay, <laughs> now okay. we know what page we're All on. All right, this is the interesting story. Uh, the, there was a story that went around. Um, that uh, Dick Morris had recommended to Clinton that at the Democratic National Convention, which occurred in late August uh, 1996, that he then make use of the Allen Hills meteorite announcement to announce a program to send humans to Mars. And then that, uh, and of course, Clinton did not announce this at the Democratic National Convention, and that was because uh, Morris had been thrown out of a leadership position in the White House due to the scandal. Uh, and this was a story that went around the space community. Well, I actually ran into Dick Morris six months ago, and um, so I asked him, is that true? Did you advise Clinton to announce a Humans to Mars program in the Democratic National Convention, and, it was, and was that in the speech? And he says, yes, and it was taken out after I got the boot. So if... Uh, if, if not for the scandal that had caused um, the termination of his uh, role uh, in uh, that White House leadership, we would have had a Humans to Mars program. And I, I think this illustrates sort of the contingent nature of history. Uh, so don't give up hope. Bad things can happen, good things can happen. Thank you, Bob. I've got I, I, I'm glad to know that, but I've always felt that Dick Morris, his comments to the uh, Ms. Rollins was that he was going to have Clinton recommend a whole new discovery program and exploration program on Mars. Now, whether we, the program that we got of a mission every 26 months was that program or not, uh, we'll have to wait and see. But Golden pushed real hard to get something going to Mars at every opportunity we had for a while. Well, yeah. Thank you for telling the story. Yes, ma'am. Is the yes, carbon-13 depletion in the Martian meteorites the same ratio as we see in terrestrial samples because of biological preference for C12 over C13? Okay, what we see in the, in the C12, C13 ratio mm -hmm. is we see first the inorganic carbon, which is the massive amount in the rock. Mm -hmm. It has a plus 38 to plus 42 per mill bay. That's a very heavy carbon. It's very unusual for inorganic phases to have that abundance of carbon. Then you go to the reduced carbon. Mm -hmm. Reduced carbon phase in that rock is in the minus, uh, minus 18 to minus 20 per mill. Now, what you're looking at is, is amazing, what's called fractionation between the plus 40 mill in the inorganic component and the minus 18 to 20 in the carbon component. Mm -hmm. So. Some unusual processes have operated. Now, whether that is a UV ozone depletion interaction with it, I think is subject to debate. Mm -hmm. But there's clearly some unusual processes operating on this. Uh -huh. But is it the same depletion 
number that we see here on Earth? On Earth, we get carbon of, of the organics like minus uh, 26 to minus 28 or so, if I recall, typical organic. Not too uh, far off the mark. Well, it, it's clearly distinct. We use the 28 in the contamination in the samples because it's a distinct release that we separate out from what is indigenous in the sample. Mm -hmm. It comes oh. out of the temperature function. Also, oh, what did you mean by NACLA? What did you mean by NACLA epoxy? Wait, I, did, I didn't hear one. Uh, I saw one of, one of the slides said something like NACLA epoxy. I still epoxy. can't hear you up from the noise back here. What? One of the slides said something about NACLA epoxy. I was wondering what that is. Okay, that was the background of where we took the sample. We took the sample and wanted to understand the background, so we went over on the side of an epoxy area that the sample attached to it, and we did that for a background. It, oh. The sample on the left is the background, the sample on the right was indigenous to the, sample, the meteorite. I see. That's, that's our control. Uh, all right, kind of figured. Mm -hmm. okay. The <clears throat> nanobacteria that forms the little worm things that uh, you guys found, uh, I've been read that they were much smaller than the ribosomes, which were considered basic uh, molecular machinery. I was just wondering if you could address that a little bit. Okay. One of our critics was Bill Shop. Bill Shop said that the size of these structures were 100 to 200 uh, uh, nanometers in size. Bill Shop is wrong by a factor of four. He was shown those images and said they're 800 to 800 nanometers to 1,000 nanometers, which are sufficient size that the ingredients of life can go inside. But one of our critics conveniently uses what supports his arguments. He's written it in his book, The Cradle of Life. There's 44 lies and mistakes in, in, in the one chapter on our meteorite that's in there. We paid Bill Shop to come and look at our samples in our laboratory that we had discovered. He spent an entire day looking at thin sections in our work. And the last comment he made when he got on the airplane headed back to UCLA was, I wished it was earlier in my career I would spend more time on a rock like this. That was from two separate people that he, that he goes back to UCLA and then he, he writes in his own book that the NASA administrator made him come to Houston to do this. No, we paid him to come to Houston to try to verify what we were doing. If people have their own agendas, and I don't mind saying this because that's the truth and there's independent verification of this. And so uh, the, the arguments on size doesn't fit. Those uh, replica structures that Hajatola Valley got, those nice curved ones, those things are up to one and a half microns long. They're plenty big, so the size arguments go away. Thank you. I just want to um, clear up my own understanding of what is the primary signature that identifies these meteorites as having come from Mars? Is it deuterium to hydrogen ratio? The trapped atmospheric gases from Mars, which not only the major components, but the isotopic ratios of the rare gases, Okay. Helium, neon, argon, and krypton, and their isotopic ratios, which were measured on Mars by the mass spectrometer of Viking, match what was done in, in, in the meteorite. Oxygen isotopes, it turns out to be a very excellent indicator. When you material in the cosmos comes together, the region of the cosmos that is brought together has that same oxygen composition. All the Earth-Moon region has one composition. The Mars has a composition. Certain of the meteorite groups have their own isotopic compositions. So it's a nebular process that leaves behind a signature. And in this case, it's the oxygen has a unique 16, 17, 18 ratios for anything from Mars. Okay. Now, the water that's in the rocks that we see in the alteration products, the orange-brown itingsite, is, has a unique deuterium to hydrogen ratio that's not anything like we see on the Earth. What it says on Mars, the light isotope has been lost and the heavy isotope stays behind and it enriches that alteration orange-brown in the heavy isotope. And that's what's been measured. And that turns out to be an excellent handle on whether it's terrestrial or extraterrestrial. Okay, well, another quick question. Uh, if you were going to do a Mars sample return design, what markers and, and, and geology would you suggest we look for to, on, on Mars to yes, go to? The Mars sample return. What would you suggest we look for in, in collecting that? I'll take the Gale site. <laughs> it's a pretty fascinating site. I'm really look anxious to see what is there. But you must remember, we also have a sampling of the planet of 58 different samples, but only one of them we think we really know where it might have come from. We think the Allen Hills meteorite, because of its age, 
came from this ancient southern highlands of Mars. That is one that we think we may have a good handle on because it's 4.06 billion years old, and the only surface like that is from the ancient highlands of Mars, which is where on that highlands we don't know, but it, we think it's from the highlands. Yes. One last question. You mentioned that um, there was less pressure when the Beagle came in than you had anticipated. I'm looking at a chart from Spiegel et al. Uh, et al. Uh, just as the Beagle detached right now that showed a, uh, a spectroscopy measurement of, of surface pressure in the Isidus Planitia area that was a little bit higher than what they expected based on the Vikings before. I know that Prasun uh, Desai from NASA says sometimes, you know, the air that's up high will move down low. So are you saying that air that was higher moved lower? Are you, uh, was there, in fact, a crash detected that was downrange? Did you ever find okay. it? On what okay. basis do you say this? Okay, I base this upon the results of the investigative report that was put together by post-incident that Mark Sims and the team put together and submitted to Parliament, which was investigated by John Cassini, who was a JPL person that went and looked at the Beagle. And what they found was the atmospheric data that they, best they had at that time of the mission coming in and that seasonal change in the Isthmus region suggested that the pressure had been decreased by as much as 40%. So you went from a 7 millibar to a 4.8 to 5 millibar atmospheric pressure in the Isthmus region. As it started coming in through that less dense atmosphere, things, the, the first the drogue chute came in. We had no laser altimeter. If you read the Pillinger's book on the Beagle Diaries, he goes through exactly why he wanted a 1.2 kilogram laser altimeter on it on his spacecraft uh, to be able to know the altitudes from the pressure. So then the drogue chute would come out in the main chute. He, he was told he had no mass available. When it turns out they had over 30 kilograms of extra mass. That the program so, manager kept in his pocket. Now, the good thing of that is that Mars Express is still in orbit with extra fuel. That 30 kilograms went into fuel, and it's staying there for a longer period of time. So you win one, you lose one. We lost a spacecraft. If we'd had that instrument, we'd got on the surface. So this spectroscopy was off considerably then? Well, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that one particular item. There's a whole bunch of factors that went into it. Four o'clock this afternoon, my son and I will be delivering a presentation. Well, unfortunately, at four o'clock, I'm in an airplane going to Houston. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll have to give you a copy of the report then. Th th right. Thank you all very Let's much. Let's thank Dr. Gibson. Thank you for. If you can catch him outside, that's a great place to ask some more questions right now.